good evening and welcome. Welcome to the Payne Whitney Mansion. Thank you very much for traveling all the way from I don't know where to the Upper East Side. I know it was a, a very complicated day in New York. Um, we are so glad you could be here with us today, tonight, for this exciting discussion, an important event for us as it marks the launch of a new tailor-made residency program for cultural figures coming from across the African continent. I'm Gaëtan Bruel, I'm the director of Villa Albertine, a newly established cultural institution launched by France almost one year ago. Headquartered in New York and based in 10 cities across the US, Villa Albertine is built on four key pillars and I would like to briefly mention them. First, a slate of 15 annual grants and professional development programs for up and coming global creators. Second, major public events throughout the year from the free outdoor festival Films on the Green in New York, in DC, in Chicago, to our flagship event, The Night of Ideas. Our third pillar is our magazine devoted to arts and ideas across online, paper, and audio formats. And of course, the fourth pillar is the reason we are here today, a tailor-made residency program. So tonight, and uh, this week in New York and for two months, we welcome five cultural leaders from the African continent to carry residencies in New York and beyond in several other cities across the country on pressing issues of global relevance from gender dynamics to the future of tech. The residents uh, are joining over 80 artists, thinkers, and cultural professionals who are participating in exploratory residences with Villa Albertine this year, and a community of already 170 residents between 2022 and, and 2023. Villa Albertine is not only based on French and American cultural exchanges, but aims to be a global platform open to all approaches and all sensibilities. And this ambition was the starting point of this new residency program designed to amplify African voices in international conversation and broaden perspectives on contemporary creation and global issues within the US and France. This program could not have been possible without the Ford Foundation and notably his president, Darren Walker. Thanks to their and to his unwavering support, we are welcoming 15 residents from Africa, five each year in 2022, 2023, and 2024. And we could not have asked for a more exciting group of residents to join us for the first iteration of this program. We are deeply grateful to world renowned curator and Africa 2020 General Commissioner Ngone Fall for her collaboration on this selection. Thanks to her expertise across the continent, we are privileged to welcome cultural change makers who work both within or well beyond our French or French speaking frameworks, which is and which was a central goal for this new selection and, and program. I want to thank the five residents who are with us today. Filmmaker uh, Baya Bensheik El Fegun from Algeria. Um, astrophysicist and visual artist Caroline Guy from Senegal. Julie Okonkwo from Nigeria, who is an ecosystem developer. Jay Pater from South Africa, who is um, an interdisciplinary artist, a choreographer, filmmaker, but also in, in other fields. And finally, Ethiopian Vancouver-based curator, Misla Lipsekal. This is the first time we gather five residents in New York to kick off their residency across the US. In New York and soon in DC, Houston, or San Francisco, they will continue their practice while exchanging with local communities, peers, cultural institutions, and more. In each city they will visit, we have no doubt with the team that their work will both take on new dimensions and leave meaningful imprints. Without further ado, I'm very happy to pass the mic to Ngone Fall as moderator of this discussion on the creative dynamics that are specific to the African continent and the issues they raise. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Gaëtan, and thank you all for making it here today on this very busy week uh, in New York. It's my absolute pleasure to have uh, this conversation that I will moderate with these five change makers from the African continent. A lot of people have been asking me, how did I 
suggested these people and why. Um, one thing is sure is that there's a current trend on the continent that has been going on for decades, which is the sense of social justice. And I guess it's um, in um, resonance with the very complicated context in which we live from north to south. And on the population of more than a billion to 100 million people caring about each other, looking after each other, whether it's family, relatives, colleagues, and friends, is something that is uh, in the back of the mind of all of us, whether we are cultural producers, academic scientists. And this uh, idea of thinking about what you're doing, why you're doing it, questioning yourself why you're doing it, and always trying to have a positive impact on communities. That's what's uh, the common ground of these uh, people who work in different fields. So with other ever start, I would like to ask you, Bahia, who is coming here with an exciting project. It's a kind of investigation that connects uh, Alger, that is known for to be the mecca of the revolutionaries, where even the Black Panthers uh, were stationed, and uh, New York City and the feminist movement. So, Bahia, how did you come across this story uh, with this ancient culture that traveled from uh, Algeria to, uh, to New York is one question I will ask you to keep in mind. But first, I would like to ask you, Caroline, as an astrophysicist, who is also a visual artist, and who's always trying to do multi-sensor installations, uh, and always, all the conversations we've been having in the past years, you were always talking about connecting people. So how are you trying to connect people, and how can a neuroscientist, astrophysicist, become a visual artist and be doing installation? I'm sure people would like to know that. Uh, so yes, uh, thanks for your question. What I think is maybe the first justice we could do to ourselves, as I'm here to speak about social justice for five minutes. So maybe the first thing we could do to ourselves would be to connect to our abilities. I think that achievements, whether in the sports field, art, science, business, or even scam, are done by developing skills. Now, I'm not saying to develop skills to swindle people. I do believe education is a big part of social justice. But I also think that in 2022, with the spread of internet in phones worldwide, uh, even in remote areas, there are other means to improve our skills. And this requires a whole lot of work, persistence, and sacrifices. Bill Gates, Steven Spielberg, Walt Disney, Richard Branson, Jay-Z, Henry Ford, uh, François Pinault, and so many others were all college or high school dropouts. I believe there are different types of intelligence, different ways of thinking, and even non-pathological neurological phenomenon like synesthesia impacting your creativity. Disabilities create new abilities, which can become pillars of a career. I like to think that difference is strength, that overlapping teeth create a person's charm, that what would be considered as a default is the root of the strength, especially if the, the person owns it, takes pride in it. Ray Kroc was a salesman to the core and never went to school. After rebuying McDonald's, he grew it into a multi-billion dollar company. I love what he said, he said, Press on. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. The world is full of educated uh, derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Astrophysics is the study of what is above our heads in space. Planets, stars, nebulae, galaxies, what is invisible to us up there based on physics. It is true that this is still a rare profession on the African continent, although there are observatories in South Africa, for example, uh, and our astrophysicists are often trained abroad. Nevertheless, little by little, astrophysicists of African origins are being trained. Modibo Diara was one of our pioneers. 
Maram Kayere, astronomer, discovered an asteroid to which he gave his name. These are people that could inspire new vocations in astrophysics. Like Ngoni said, I don't know if she said that actually, I mix uh, uh, art and science to create <laughs> installations. <laughs> I interpret how theoretical or experimental physics influences, unbeknownst to us, our daily lives, to take stock and reflect on our society. I create installations that are to be experienced more than to be looked at. Children, as well as adults, are intrigued by my work mixing physics and creation. The installation quantum tunneling presented at this uh, 2022 Dakar Biennial, for example, that you can see on my website, even brought people from other cities to see it. People who at first sight would not be interested in art came to see contemporary art, making art accessible. Maybe this would inspire children to become physicists astronauts, artists. Also, I am more and more interested in neuroscience and that is something I implement in my academic research. Choosing art while being a physicist is a 180 degree turn. In order to make that decision... How did it happen? Uh, that, that decision? The ship, yes. Yes, it's because uh, I think it's in America it's the eighth grade. I used to love physics. Uh, but I've always been creating, uh, and I was, in my room, I was uh, drawing things of my height already. So in the eighth and grade... your grandfather is a famous African. Yes, yes, and my grandfather was known as the African Picasso, and he created the flag of Togo. Can you say the name? So yeah, his name is Paul Ayi. Voilà. <laughs> yes, so I grew up in this uh, artistic environment, and so in the eighth grade, quatrième, huh? Uh, I had the first physics classes and I loved physics where my, my teacher was so strict and gave us so many homeworks and stuff. And so after that, I started being very interested in astrophysics, in what's going on up there in astronauts. And so uh, when you have to choose your upper studies, that's when I decided to study astrophysics, but I, I kept on creating. And that was my really, my, my secret pleasure. I wasn't sharing it with anybody while my father was like, you should, you should show your work. And finally, finally, at one point, like it, it was just something that happened by chance. I, I showed my work to a person who worked in the art field and who was like, uh, who wanted it for her gallery. And that's how it started, because I was like, what? And uh, afterwards, I started uh, showing my work and, uh, and exhibiting. And at one point, I was like, well, I've always been hesitating between the two, so I'm going to, 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 to dive 100% in, in that and I'm so happy because uh, while I, uh, I keep on creating and I've seen that physics is part of the art I'm creating and now I am very lucky to be able to for certain projects to to work with laboratories of astrophysics quantum physics to create artworks so you're going to meet the NASA, you're going to meet the NASA people uh, yes. in Houston yes yes I'm so excited <laughs> and you, your, your last installation in Toulouse at the Space uh, City, it was also working with the sound of a uh, Mars uh, expedition, right? Yes, it was a fantastic experience. <laughs> and thanks for that. Because, uh, so the, the installation was about spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the science of uh, light. And actually, I worked with uh, Silvestre Maurice, who built... Uh, the head of the robot, Perseverance, which is right now on planet Mars. So I, I, with him, I visited his laboratory, the things that they prepared to go to the moon, to go to Mars, and with his postdoc, Baptiste Schitt, who is working on sounds from planet Mars, which is something completely new in physics. I could implement these sounds of spectroscopy from planet Mars in the installation spectroscopy, which was a world first that I didn't know. <laughs> so I've been told that I was like, yeah, cool, fantastic. And so these are extraordinary experiences that you, that you have to live, like meeting people, meeting um, uh, scientists from laboratories. That's why I'm so excited to go to Houston because I know that, that I, I'll meet incredible people and, uh, and uh, have experiences in neuroscience laboratories because there are two of these laboratories specialized in science and creativity, which is very rare in the world. And there is uh, NASA, the GSC over there, and also uh, it's also a cultural hub. So I have like three components of my PhD 
in Houston, so that was really the place to be to, to do that residency. Bahia, you're also planning to meet uh, amazing women while you're here. Can you tell us more about what drives you as a filmmaker? Hello. Uh, in fact, I was reading a book about uh, the, the figure of uh, the witch. And uh, at a point, uh, there is uh, this group of feminists in the end of 60s that, um, that called themselves witch, and they uh, hexes Wall Street. And uh, the legend wants that uh, the day after the, this hex, uh, la, la Bourse fell down. And while... The New York Stock Exchange dropped. Okay, <laughs> so while um, they, they were, were doing this, uh, this hex, they uh, chanted an Algerian, Berberian, Ber Berber song from uh, sacred uh, Algerian witches. And this, this, uh, this sentence really uh, wakes up my, my curiosity and I decided to, to, to it was an investigation and uh, how we say in cat? A quest. A quest. Uh, and what was this song who travels from a continent to another at this time beyond the, something like an, uh, an infranchissable uh, borders? And I have the feeling that I'm, I'm making exactly the same uh, travel just to, to come here and uh, try to find those feminists uh, and to, to understand their, um, their activism and also... Um, just to be in, in the same way of what you say, what you said before, uh, the question of the creativity, be because it was a creative uh, way to struggle. And um, for me, it's, it's really in, in the center, in the heart of my, my work as a filmmaker, uh, because uh, I think it's first of all a question of uh, finding our own language to, to, to tell our own story and, uh, and our um, and to produce our narrative. I think it's really important as, as a filmmaker, as Algerian, as African, with the, um, an ancestral culture and a really rich history. Uh, I always like to say that my, my hometown, Constantine, is one of the oldest cities in the world. It has something like 2,500 years, 2,500 ans d'histoire. And as a female filmmaker, with this uh, uh, heritage and uh, heritage. heritage and this background, uh, really, I have to think and act the world in which I live. J'ai pensé à acter le monde, and it's a real responsibility for me. Uh, and that's why uh, cinema documentary is uh, is really a way of life for me. And it's uh, c'est une manière d'être au monde. It's um, it's, it's to be in the world and to, to deal with, uh, with essential questions. And uh, it, it makes sense and it brings me into, uh, into direction. For example, today it's not more enough for me to make uh, movies about feminist issues only. I just need also to work with, with uh, feminine uh, technicians, with a crew who is exclusive, exclusively ma women. women. Because as a director, I, um, I create this space where, uh, where women's skills, where women's uh, experience can be um, uh, updated, uh, s'actualiser, où les compétences et l'expérience des femmes peuvent s'actualiser. I, I think that it's really important uh, that as women, we have to work together and we have to, 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 to take, nous avons apporté, no, our own um, uh, préoccupation. To carry our own conscience. Now I'm an official translator. <laughs> Thank you. Don't move to Thank Arabic so, because so, so I think much. nobody will understand <laughs> I, 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 except okay. you and okay. me. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, that's why cinema is really uh, um, uh, a powerful tool of changement and also, um, let's say, a weapon of, of resistance and of uh, transmission of our uh, struggles, of our identity. And... Um, I really tend to, to, to be in this uh, coherence and in the way that my, my professional choices uh, goes in the same way as my, my personal life. I am uh, also uh, the mother of two kids and it's uh, a demanding role that uh, asks me to, to be aware of uh, which model of uh, woman I have to be in my daily life and also which model of a woman I have to, to pass on. 
so, so this coherence, I think that documentary is makes change in, in all those fields of my life. As a woman, as a filmmaker, and also it makes change in the life of people who receive my work. So that's why um, it's, it's, it's something that um, ki englobe everything, everything in my your, life. Your documentaries, are they uh, in Arabic or in French, the ones you made in the past? Uh, I, I used to ask people to speak Arabic, really, but uh, but finally, I just let them speak in the in, in the world they, they, they feel uh, themselves. It's really it's important to, to be, just to be. And with this uh, project where you want to meet those feminists of the 60s, are you planning a documentary out of out of that? Of course, yes. of course, really, and uh, and f and really a creative documentary. I was um, I wanted to bring a camera. And really, I, I really wanted to film those uh, those meetings with people, but after that, I said to myself, no, it um, you you just first of all have to to drop in this adventure, really, because I'm uh, I'm really in, in something that I totally totally uh, don't know anything, and I I have faith that uh, that life will really brings me uh, brilliant things, and with that, I will think. Uh, a, a movie uh, that will go beyond. Be and maybe you will come back then with a the camera to for film, sure to film the interviews. <laughs> no, no, for sure I will come back. Be okay. Because when when you you said uh, about what you're doing with storytelling and kind of reclaiming uh, memory and being uh, the author of your of the narratives, Misla, that's also what you've been doing. Uh, as a researcher, as a, as a creator, looking at oral transmission, family stories, and how they connect to a more, let's say, global and official history. And now you are connecting dots between the African continent, Canada, and now the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about what are you trying to do and how also you are using culture as a weapon of resistance? Uh, yes, so uh, thank you, Ngone, for this uh, question. Um, yesterday, when we had a dinner together, uh, Gone said one thing to us, put your guts on the table. So I'm going to try to do my best uh, to really do that and just to be really personable and, and, uh, and speak to uh, this question, but also why I feel um, so blessed, really, to be amongst uh, this group of individuals who also will talk to you, really, in their own way about knowledge transmission and archive. Um, for the longest time, I've really been thinking about how it is that we know what we know. Um, and so that has really connected me to the idea of library, um, but it's also made me think about what dispossession actually looks like. Um, and like you, Ngone, I came to art by way of writing, um, where I took my own uncertainty and my own doubt. And I, you know, in, in the words of Fela, when he said, who no no, go no. I've been going to find, you know, and uh, was it two years ago or about two and a half years ago when this opportunity to participate in the Africa 2020 season came up? Um, uh, I'm going to you, you put, you raised the standard for all of us that we're going to participate. You said, um, what does it mean to be thinking about the world from an African perspective? And I took that idea um, or that, that uh, notion. Um, and I also thought that I would challenge myself by thinking about uh, what you called augmented orality, which was enhanced orality. Um, and so through this fantastic gathering of nine uh, women practitioners, interdisciplinary um, artists, um, what I realized for myself was that they really um, blew open this idea of archive. Um, you know, you hear Bahia talking about women's stories, about dance, about resistance. Jay will also talk to you about uh, the body. Uh, Judith is going to talk to you about technology and storytelling. And Carolyn has just told us about uh, astrophysics and, and visual arts. Um, and for myself, you know, bringing these contemporary artists that are not working in the same medium together, um, I really had to grapple with what is it that they could all come together and speak about. And what I realized was that at the end of the day, they were all talking about um, how we have come to be humans in ways that are adverse for racialized people. 
And while that idea is, 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 is actually kind of painful, if I'm really honest, one of the things that I decided for myself is that I needed to transition from speaking simply about pain to things that are hopeful uh, for myself and for the people who look like me. Um, and so that question really pointed me in a direction that says um, what I think is actually the most important question for our time which is really how do we share this earth? Because underneath that, we're talking about histories of dispossession, of violence, um, and you know, as somebody who is Ethiopian Eritrean that came to Canada by way of Swaziland, which is right next to South Africa, during apartheid times and ending up in Canada, I can truly and honestly say that I only started to think about what it means to be Canadian and live in Canada by thinking about what it means to be African. Because it was through that lens I could understand what dispossession could look like for indigenous people. And so, um, you know, when we had this conversation together with Ngone saying, you know, where are you with your thinking? Where are you going? Um, I had really been thinking about, like, how do I, how do I labor um, for people who look like me and, and for who people who I should by, um, uh, Oh, how do I say it? Um, there's an ethic required of me to participate. Um, and so I really started to see, okay, well, I can speak to the indigenous context by thinking about what it means to be black, what it means to be in the diaspora, what it means to be African. Um, and so uh, I, I was listening actually to a, a podcast and it was literally like this, the lights went off in my head because um, this podcast presented some really dire statistics. The first one is that it said that in the last 150 years, the ways that humans have lived on this planet has com consequently changed it. You know, if we open the news today, you know, we've heard about what is it, what's happening in Puerto Rico. We know what's happening in Southeast Asia with flooding. I mean, these are really, really significant things. Um, and to parlay that into like maybe statistics that we can understand further, it says that at this point in time, one million species, plant and animal, are about to be extinct. I don't know what the population here is in, in New York, but I think it might be around six million, just in Manhattan, something like that. So just think of it in terms of one million of six million is just on the verge of being wiped out. That's, that sounds really um, scary. Um, but in the context of this podcast, um, what they spoke about is that there are ways for being in the world that produce diversity and that can produce uh, wellness, if you want to say it. And this was from an indigenous perspective because they had found um, something called a forest garden. And what they realized in this forest garden was that it was a space that nobody had been inhabiting in for like, I think it was maybe 300 years, but was still producing life on so many levels. Um, and so really, you know, so the light went off in my head because I was like, okay, this, this, is, this is an example of the kind of stories that I believe that we can start talking uh, to through art. If we start opening up this idea of what are archives, like for example, plant archives. So through this residency, I will be spending most of my time in DC and I will have a little bit of time here in um, New York. Uh, to visit with curators and institutions, uh, particularly in the Smithsonian Network, as well as um, uh, at Howard University, to see how curators are thinking about storytelling to, as Bia, but, sorry, Bahia said, to tell stories for us, by us. And for me, that's not an exclusionary kind of idea, because already in our thinking, we are talking about an ethic of being together in its most comprehensive way. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Being together, Jay, that's what you've been doing uh, as a scholar, as a professor at the university, somebody who runs two live art festivals and who also started the Institute for Creative Arts. So can you tell us a little bit about how via your work as an academic as a choreographer, theater player, also a curator, you've been 
putting people together of different generations, also transmitting knowledge via workshops or your, your work as a professor, and also how, that's my opinion, how the body becomes like the echo chamber of all these stories, whether painful stories related to the past of South Africa, but also how are you projecting us uh, in the future with all the endless conversations we've been having the past 15 years. Um, the, the idea of, of being together in a kind of activism and art was almost, um, um, it, it's, it, wasn't, it was almost not an option uh, growing up uh, in during apartheid and all and all of that, but just to to if my history is a combination of uh, uh, the descendants of slaves from uh, India when you know the UK was all over the place. Yeah, they they were in South Africa and in um, in in London in the in the UK at the same and in um, on the on the uh, in, uh, in India and in South Africa at the same time and. Um, and I think that from knowing that history and, and coming, growing up in an atmosphere of black consciousness, the idea of, um, of, of being together and bringing together always felt like such an impossibility because everything militated against it. And probably one of the through lines which you're alluding to in your last um, quest, uh, part of your question is around memory and the the idea of the past is such a contentious one in the world and it is something that i think black people have to often feel like one has to defend whenever you talk to it and working actively against this this very voracious erasure that happens in the world, an erasure of pasts, yeah? And it's very, very important for the ushering in of modernity, yeah? To, to really make us all feel like we live in this singular, modern, um, existential environment without, without that past. So one doesn't understand those impulses of fragility, those sudden drops, those psychic distensions, um, which I, I was extremely, I was very attuned to in, our, in South Africa, of course, and, uh, and which brings me to my connection with this through this fellowship in New York and in the United States because, of course, we've seen eruptions of that in the past few years. And those are very significant and they're very powerful for the world because they had so much purchase throughout the entire world. And if we cast our mind's eye to how systematically a continuity to a past was, was actively pulled away, it, it is now uh, really, f it's, it's, no, um, it's no surprise that many uh, uh, live artists, Fastal Lunyukula, who you probably know is a very good example, work through their bodies to talk to uh, a, a much more innate memory, yeah? a much more, uh, a, a memory that you cannot, uh, you cannot easily get rid of because it is cellular. And, and talk to not just um, the need to, to find these continuities, but the need for uh, for one to address intergenerational trauma. And then with something like South Africa, the, the need to go back to the past is precipitated by the present. Yeah. It's not just a fanciful, nostalgic thing. It's because when you are constantly in a South Africa is one of the most unequal, or about the most unequal societies in the world. 28 years after democracy with a black government. And that's because in 1994, even though we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and all of that, you know, hey, we missed a very important reparations notion. Yeah, we missed, we missed the, the addressing land and wealth. So we have, we have spiraled into a society that's, looking, that's in on itself, creating further inequality and without addressing the, 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 the triggering points 
of poverty that really, you know, when you ask yourself, how did we get to where we are? So many, many artists are working through the body in, uh, in doing that. And I think, I think that a lot of the live art work that we are, we are working with now, and, and just to, lastly, just to talk a little bit about, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm really interested in African diasporic artists who, who connect this so that even when we are, because I am interested in curating some uh, African artists that are coming to uh, institutions in the United States, but having a conversation so that it is not just, again, once more the parade of African bodies, but a, a, a discourse with the African diaspora around this issue of, of archive and the body as archive and the importance of a contemporary memory. Contemporary memory. Judith, you are the, I will say, maybe the number one activist on this on this panel uh, with many, many challenges that you are addressing from not just from Lagos and from West Africa or, or the continent uh, with the tech industry. Uh, the way you were able to pull together a massive network of studios on the continent of creative thinkers and how does that resonate with what your, brings you here uh, to the States and what's your agenda? Um, first of all, I just want to, you know, just really comment on my fellow panelists <laughs> that I'm sitting with because I am so in awe of their work. And I want to mention it because I think in a way, a little bit of what they each do has brought me here today. Um, so the work that I do is around ecosystem development for the extended reality technology. So augmented reality, virtual reality and mixed reality. And I'll get to, to that in a, a minute. But often I'm asked how I started that journey. And when I'm asked, I often mention that as a child, I was someone that wanted to go to the moon. And so when I hear Caroline speak of astrophysics and you know um, inspiring children and what it means to go further, it just absolutely resonates for me because in a way that was the beginning of my journey. And I see the connections between you know, that childhood and the technologies and the things that will enable much of the work that we have talked about here today. Um, and I say that because we all have probably heard the word metaverse, <laughs> uh, probably ad nauseum right now, if we're being honest, uh, and we've heard it and we probably wonder what it is. I would say that a lot of people probably do not know yet, but there is a lot of speculation. One thing that we do know, though, is that the technologies that I mentioned, augmented, virtual, and mixed reality, are the gateway technologies for whatever this thing will be. This digital reality, this alternate existence that we will have in parallel with our physical lives. Now, those gateway technologies, I, as we can all see, are, are being engaged with in, in various ways. Um, Right now, you can see a lot of emphasis on entertainment and gaming and things like that. You can see concentrations in certain parts of the world. But one thing that is, you know, I suppose inevitable, uh, and this is something that you'll hear people say a lot, especially when they think back to some of the fantasies that we live through in movies like um, the Marvel films, is that as a you know, civilization, we're all moving towards spatial computing, and that is moving beyond the way that we engage with systems today via our mobile phones or our tablets or computers to, um, and now I'll go back to that uh, Marvel movie reference. If you're a fan of movies like Iron Man, you might remember Jarvis um, that Iron Man would interact with where you would see all of the different sort of like um, bits of information that he would want to interact with visually available and he could manipulate it. Um, but that's spatial computing in the childish sense, but one that is becoming more and more real and will in the end be the way that we all engage. Now that technology will be pervasive. It will affect every element of life for humanity, every single element. And I think that if that is the case, then one thing that is really critical is that we need to be thinking about how we make sure that everyone is a part of that story. Everyone is a part of shaping it. Everyone is a part of making sure that it is something that works for us all. I think it goes without saying, 
even as we consider the different stories that we've heard you know, this evening, um, that sometimes humans can get it wrong. <laughs> that sometimes we might you know, go into things without quite thinking about the consequences. And I think often um, that has come about because only some people perhaps have shaped the way things will be um, or have defined it. We can see challenges with technologies like uh, artificial intelligence right now. And there's a very real chance for us to change that. Now, for me, what that means practically is that I will do and work with people uh, to make sure that these technologies are more widely accessible. And I say more widely accessible because there is an extraordinary amount of talent on the African continent extraordinary um, and when I see what is possible when they engage with those technologies it's it's transformational now that transformational ability will always be limited if we are um, <laughs> sort of like geo blocking access to the technologies so what does it look like when we make sure that everybody is participating is shaping and is creating the future that we want um, so that's the work that brings me here today. And that work means that I'll be engaging with multiple stakeholders. I'll be engaging with big tech, obviously, um, who right now are defining much of what that technology will be. Um, but it will also have me engaging um, with African governments. It will also have me engaging with international organizations. And all of these different um, voices that in many, many ways are starting to think about what the future will be when it comes to this metaverse that will be and these technologies and how they will shape all that is to come. Thank you very much. So from the past, the super future, the right now future, mm -hmm. uh, how are you connecting yesterday, today and tomorrow? So these are my current heroes, the five change makers that I suggested for this uh, residency at Villa Albertine. Maybe there's a little bit of time for a question, even if I heard the champagne popping up. <laughs> but please, if you have uh, questions uh, to any of them, feel free to ask. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my question is for Judith. That sounds amazing, um, but it also sounds really scary. What is your biggest fear going into it, and how are you and your team planning to avoid that happening? Um, so, so my biggest fear, honestly, is that things will stay the way they are. And by, by things staying the way, like the status quo will be maintained. And the maintaining of that status quo will mean that um, there is a, a great imbalance um, when it comes to access to these technologies. That great imbalance will, I mean, we, we've heard, <laughs> we've heard um, a, a lot of talk about the digital divide, and right now we're only considering it on the level of, you know, the kind of computing that we do. I think when we get to spatial computing, and, you know, that divide has started from now, it will be catastrophic. And I'm sure when I say that, a lot of people are like, well, why, why would you think that? Um, it's because... If you look at a lot of the grand challenges that we have currently, um, I honestly believe that they can't be solved with traditional means or traditional tech, that we will have to think very, very differently about things. And that will mean tapping into these technologies and leveraging things like the metaverse. Now, there are a whole bunch of other problems that really, you know, as you know, humanity, we should consider. There are issues around ethics and privacy and security and all of that. Um, but I think that before we get to those very, very real concerns, everybody has to be part of the conversation so that when we are deciding where we stand when it comes to ethics and privacy and all of that, that we have all agreed what it will be and not just one group of people telling everybody else how it will be. Um, so yes, my greatest problem is that things will stay the way they are. What are we doing about it? Well, we're here and we're gonna make noise. <laughs> So my name is Marcel Befa. I come from Benin, West Africa. I'm dancer and choreographer, and I'm artistic director of uh, Centre Choreographique Multicore. So we talk about education. 
And do you think uh, it's just education? Or do education include information? Because from my experience, I think uh, more we don't have uh, we don't have information. Some people host the information, and this is uh, something really bad for development. Uh, the second question: Do you have uh, uh, the great condition to be connected to what you are doing today? Uh, I'm talking about uh, financial condition, uh, the really good person around you, uh, and and when did you uh, decide to work with your root? Uh, this question because most we think I think the colonization took something really important it how to be proud about us and this I'm talking that because I'm talking about Vodun who is something really important so uh, it's why I am asking this question uh, I, I think in so many respects you you're answering the questions as you are speaking them, um, because, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I, there, there, there are just so many ideas and issues there, and I think that the, um, the, the you know, the one thing that, if, if there's anything that has been ruptured or taken away is, um, is our contemporary, yeah, is what is our contemporary. So, we, whatever form we have in, in the, when there was such a thing as intercultural work and all of that, there was an attempt to constantly put our work, when I say our work, I'm talking about the colonized or the previously colonized work within the framework of modernity. You know, we are constantly in that kind of conversation. What I'm searching for more and more is trying to shrug that off and see and really try to investigate what is the contemporary that is beyond looking at ourselves in that frame of tradition or you know the uh, uh, the the, the you know, uh, kind of like a the the, the special. I'm trying to find that language. I mean, I think one of the big things that I'm also doing is looking at the idea of trembling, uh, taking from Glissard's notion of, of trembling, that there isn't a stable, because I think when, when the ruptures happened in our lives, they, that, that was it, you know? The body uh, you know, is still reeling and ricocheting. So, um, so, so drawing from our uh, without thinking of what what indigeneity is as tradition, but as as contemporary, as in the now and of the future, um, how how do we factor in this notion of of trembling, of 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 moving back and forth without having to be stable, without having to be you know certitude? And I think that's for me anyway. That's what causes the most amount of trauma in the body that it has to be this one thing, because we were, in our ancient ways, been made into so many different things. So how, how, do, how, we, how do we tremble through, through all of that? I hope that comes close to it. How do people receive your work for, for everybody? Uh, and which kind of uh, class? have access? Well, I, I, we do, uh, I do a lot of public sphere work. I work inside public spaces and, I, and, I, and the, idea, the, the idea always is there is that even though you know, it comes from some kind of theory and all of that with, um, that the work finds its way in, in, a, in, a, in, a, public sp in a public space in a kind of a, in, in public engagement. Um, and I think, I think that when, when that happens, like um, there's sometimes in, in this festival that I direct called Infecting the City, last year we called it Uninfecting the City. Um, 
in this in this in this desire to move take the work out of the 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 elite and 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 and, and have a dialogue have a real dialogue uh, we've had the, it's 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 just extraordinary and most surprising what what happens how something really conceptual or whatever works and because because again it's it's going back to what is the contemporary the contemporary is being drawn from like you your work does from say from something like voodoo but but again i try to resist even in the curation try to resist it constantly trying to f fit into a modern frame i'm not, i'm not saying i'm successful it's <laughs> at all um, because it's very, uh, oh, you know, it's uh, this idea of being part of this whole modernity thing, and if it's, is is it's very difficult to avoid. So you constantly feel like you have to dialogue with it, or you won't survive. It's like you know, learning English or learning uh, the colonial language. You feel like you won't survive, but we have to keep investigating. How is it possible to create a body that doesn't have to be modern? Yes, I'm just um, resonating with what you were just speaking about. I'm also a choreographer. We're here with people from Martha Graham, and I wanted to ask about trauma and dance and the body and how you're addressing that. I, you know, you, I think, I think I, in my own work, I work a lot with releasing trauma or... Um, so anatomically and working through a range of different um, um, different work which is located in South Africa, but also work like the Alexander Technique, et cetera, to, to, to release trauma. And then from there, it is possible to create a space to then reflect on trauma. And in reflecting on trauma, you share that experience of that journey with a wider group of people. I think that's, um, yeah, that I, as far as possible, we try to, I've, over the years, try to move away from representing trauma and finding, uh, f you know, finding ways in which audiences are involved in, um, in an investigation or in looking at, uh, looking at trauma without necessarily watching traumatic episodes, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and destabilizing people as a result. So we take Smooth, the last one. Yeah, but I don't. I don't want it to seem as if we're heaping on on Jay, uh, but but I'm just, I'm just going to go back to 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 Jay, um, and it's because um, you did say something about um, part of what you want to do uh, while you're here is to think beyond the body, but figure out think beyond the body to to sort of uh, begin a dialogue with the diaspora. So I want you to flesh that out because you want us to look beyond the body. And I know that all the, the questions that have been thrown at you has, has really been about the body and trauma, but I want, I want you to talk about a little bit more about the project you intend to do, which is really to go beyond the body and to begin what you, you said should be a real dialogue with the diaspora. Uh, if you can speak a little bit about that, that would be great. Um, I, I think there was a word missing there. I, I didn't say think beyond the body, but I, I meant think beyond the, in the curation, just bringing African bodies. Think or, the, I mean, the way I understood it is thinking beyond the surface of the body. Yeah. Oh, it's, oh, <laughs> it's, it is quite huge. I mean, I, and, and I, um, the, 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 the best thing I could I, I could talk to is is the fact that well well for a start the work the, the, the choreographic work is called surface tension it, it comprises nine installations in a public space yeah but the 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 curation is is something completely different I can talk to you a little bit more about the actual mechanics. I, I don't want to bore the audience with what the mechanics of it are. He'll be around for a couple of weeks and even more. Yeah. So you'll have time to and, and go and visit Smooth at MoMA.
Perhaps if Ngoni allow me to do so, we have time for one more question. Perhaps for Baia, Judith, Misla, or Caroline. Hi, last question for everyone. Maybe you can uh, finish it all uh, in a sentence. The future is. The future is. I just think to to two things. The future is feminine, and the future is is really. Um, uh, our kids, our kids, all. The future is transmission and work. The future is Africa. Hey. <laughs> There's been an artwork that I've seen going around, um, and it says there are black people in the future. I saw that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all, my dear change makers. Thank you to the audience on this crazy day with traffic who were able to make it. I think my brother never made it to the room. Well, I'll, I think it's going to be also available on your YouTube channel starting tomorrow. Yes, because I have friends in Dakar who are like, when can we see it, when can we see it? So for those who missed it, go on the YouTube channel of Villa Albertine and you'll be able to watch it and share it with friends. And these fives are going to be around. Uh, Bahia and Jay are going to be based in New York. Uh, Caroline is here until I think uh, a few more days. Then she's heading to Houston. Uh, Judith is here until Saturday and then she'll go to California and then Washington DC. And Misla is going I think tomorrow to DC but she's coming back also to uh, to New York because she wants to go back to the Strombo Center and meet, let's say, the, the black community. So thanks, you Telma, for taking time to come. And I would like you to have a round of applause for these five great people. <laughs>